even when I was in the midst of trauma, even like directly in the midst of it, that joy shone through because my resistance had stepped aside. Please note this episode contains potentially triggering topics such as abuse, sexual assault, and sex trafficking. Hey everybody, welcome to Tales from the Journey. I'm Stephanie Zamora, and today I am so excited to have Callion Smith here. And Callion is somebody that I had the pleasure of meeting. I don't even know how we connected, but somehow we connected online and we've had a couple few different chats over the years, the past year at least, mm-hmm. about our work and how it really parallels each other in really fun ways. And so I'm so excited to have you here. Callion is the creator of The Prosperity Path, which we're going to talk a lot about and is passionate about helping survivors of abuse find joy, peace, and prosperity in their lives. And so he is a survivor of sex trafficking, facing abuse from early childhood into adulthood and lives with PTSD, which I can relate to for different reasons, chronic fatigue and dissociative identity disorder. And so we'll be chatting about as much of this as, as we can today, as well as your amazing work. But Callion, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be a part of your community. <clears throat> also, excuse me, I have really bad allergies today. So <laughs> <laughs> my voice is not you know, normally this like cracky. Um, <laughs> but Yeah, I'm really, really grateful to be here and to be able to share some of my journey and um, really, you know, some of the things that I've gone through, what joy really means to me and what I think it can mean to a lot of us, whether we've gone through trauma or not, Um, because I think joy is something that we need in order to navigate this world in a way that we we can thrive as well as we can make the world a better place too. So I can't wait to share all that. Yay. I would love to start. um, If you could share just a little bit about yourself, maybe some fun facts about who you are and a little bit about the work that you do. Yeah, sure. So a couple of fun facts first. So I have um, an adorable like emotional support animal. She used to be my service dog, but then she got scared of everything. So she's no longer (laughs) my service dog um, named Tally. I'm also a watercolor artist and I love painting flowers. Um, So those are kind of some fun facts about me. And then as far as like my story and a little bit of the work that I do, just very briefly. So I, like you introduced, um, I'm a sex trafficking survivor. I was abused at a very young age and groomed by my trafficker, um, like around six or seven. So really early into that um, abusive, exploitive industry. And um, so I dealt with that trauma for a long time. And then I was also re-victimized as a young adult by my best friend. So it's been about six years since I've been out of any sort of abusive situation. And in that time, I got really invested in how do I not only just like heal and stabilize and do things like that, but I wanted more than that. Like, because I, you know, I saw so many things that were saying like, oh, okay, you can, you know, cope with PTSD in this way, or you can, you know, um, find some sort of stability, or you can have a little bit of calm here. Here's how you can tame a panic attack. And those are all great and fantastic things. But I was like, but I want more. Like I want this sense, this deeper sense. Um, And I think one thing that really kind of triggered that was when I was really in the midst of like feeling a lot of my pain from my past. And I just happened to pass by this really beautiful pink flower um, where I was living at the time down in Baltimore. It was just next to me. It was in the sun. It just caught my eye. And I just had this still moment where I was just like, I feel something different. And I was like, I feel like that was joy. So I started to explore that sort of thing. I like felt this little glimmer of that and I started to explore it. And that really brought me to the work that I do. So as far as like what I actually do, I create e-courses. I plan on creating a lot more like smaller e-courses as well, but I have my kind of signature one, which is the prosperity path, possibly going to be renamed in the future. Who knows? Um, (laughs) (laughs) That's life, right? (laughs) Um, (laughs) But um, but so I have the prosperity path, which is basically these sort of steps that I found in my own journey to really uncover and utilize joy in that healing process. So I offer that to survivors of abuse or anyone else who wants to join, but it's from an abuse um, lens. Yeah. And, and then I want to create more e-courses. And then I also work one-on-one with clients as well for people who really want to kind of like explore it or share lived experience that I have too. So awesome. yeah, that's a bit, a bit of an intro. I'm really excited to get into joy with you. I know for a long time in my life, I couldn't stand that word. It didn't make any sense. <laughs> like, what is joy? <laughs> mm-hmm. So I'm excited to chat with you about that, but I would love to start, you know, we really kind of follow the journey mapping process in these interviews and, and the hero's journey framework. And so take us back to who you were. And I know that was a long time ago and, and it might even be hard to connect to some aspects of that, but who you were before 
before we mm -hmm. get started. Excuse my dog. That was the sweetie I was just mentioning. <laughs> <laughs> so gosh, who I was before this all started. So well, this kind of brings up the dissociative identity disorder that you mentioned. So because I was abused at such a young age and, um, and groomed and had trauma happen and things like that, basically my entire identity formed in a different way than your average person. Um, so instead of forming one personality, which is what most children do, we kind of get into this world, we don't have a sense of self, and then we learn who we are as we go. My brain had to separate that into compartments because one sort of whole brain that remembered all of the trauma I was going through was just too much to handle. Yeah. So my brain basically <clears throat> created these sort of like units in a way. And each of those developed just like a normal child would of their own personality. Um, so who I was before all of this <laughs> was uh, five people. And, um, or at least like, you know, as far as my earliest consciousness goes, is that I was five different people all learning to navigate the world both together wow. and separately, which was a really unique experience. Um, and this condition, just for your audience, is actually surprisingly common. It's estimated to be about 1% of the population. And that's because trauma rates are so high. So, yeah. um, so I just want to throw out that little tidbit of information there. But basically, yeah, so that was a big part of it. But I think the kind of like turning point for me, because I know that you, know, you like have mentioned how that is part of this journey as well. So the before, I think, was actually before 2020 is what I would consider my before now, which is where I was five people and... I was experiencing that. And now just recently I went through something called final fusion, which is where um, all of the identities came together and formed me who I am today. So right now I'm just one person. Um, and that is a whole different thing because it's not like yeah. I returned back to an original person. I became someone totally new, like in the yeah. most literal way that a person can. I literally am a different person than has ever existed before 2020. Um, and that's why I recently changed my name, which I know that you know you were you have been a part of my journey since before yes. I had um, before I had the name Kelly on as well. So yeah, so I think that's kind of my before would be someone who or a collection of people really who were all still full and complete people, but also had this unique challenge of living life side by side and not really having access to a full life because there just weren't that many hours in the day. So if one altar, which is what these parts are called, if one altar was up front, then another altar couldn't be living their life and things like that. So yeah. my before was really before I had access to life as a whole. And I still yeah. had access to things like joy and exploration and curiosity and goodness, but it was in a different way. So I would say yeah. that that was my before. That's where I'm going to establish that. that awesome. Mm -hmm. What was it like to navigate through so many of the challenges and experiences that you faced having those five different parts of yourself like how did you reconcile what was happening were you able to did that come later yeah so one of the unique things about the condition is that you have inner dialogue so you can actually like talk with the other parts of yourself just like you're having a conversation with someone else except you don't typically depends on the person with the condition but at least in my experience it wasn't like i was hearing a voice it was more like i knew that it was a different part of my brain talking yeah. um, a different identity so sort of like how we have a little inner critic you know it's similar to that except a little bit more differentiated um so that was most of how i pieced a lot of my narrative together but i think the thing that really triggered um this change of becoming you know me just one person was actually remembering the entire narrative because mm -hmm. um, back in the beginning of 2020 or the very end of 2019, um, my trafficker actually started to stalk me. So I was living in the oh, same town wow. and I had all of us like as different identities, we had different pieces of these memories and we had started to get like, started to piece things together and be like, okay, there was definitely like, you know, monetary exchange for sex. And there was definitely like, you know, these things that were going on but the whole narrative wasn't there. And then it started to really come together with that. I was like, oh, I know who it is now. I know exactly what happened. Because one of the key things with DID, this condition, is um, you tend to block out memories. Like that's part of it is that you have chronic amnesia. Yeah. Um, so that started to disappear. And I started to get this clear picture of a narrative. And we all, as separate identities, talked about that and pieced things together. And then sort of started to share memories in a way where there was less compartments and there was more like, community, more connection, more shared thought and feeling and memory. And that's, I think, what led to this. So, yeah. so it was very interesting navigating the world before that, where it was this sort of separation. Um, and yet this beautiful teamwork as well. Like there was a lot of beauty in that. And to be honest, I don't think any of us actually really wanted that to disappear until suddenly it felt right to go through yeah. Final Fusion. Yeah. Um, 
So it was a really interesting way of going about the world. And it did teach me a lot about communicating with my emotions too, because I learned about the power of inner dialogue. So that was a huge thing as well. So huge benefits as well as, you know, these challenges that it brought yeah. on. Yeah. Did you have a choice in what part of you was front and center? Sometimes. Um, once I learned about the condition, once I learned a little bit more, some of that choice became more relevant, but not necessarily. So every altar has different roles. So maybe in like a state of being threatened by someone feeling unsafe, mm -hmm. an altar that had a protective role would come up front. So depending on certain triggers, um, sometimes that would cause what's called just a switch, which is a very logical name, um, yeah. would cause a switch to happen. And um, sometimes certain altars are better at handling different emotions. So if one was experiencing emotion, there would be a switch or things like that. So um, by the end, by once we had like a really good grip on, you know, the condition and how to navigate it and stuff, I would say that the switching happened probably um, involuntarily, probably only about 20% of the time. So for the most part, um, through treatment and things like that, I was able to be yeah. in control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was it like growing up having those five different altars and identities? And was there a particular point where you were like, oh, not everybody experiences the world this mm -hmm. way? To be honest, I kind of thought that was everybody's world, except I thought I was a little bit more like um, spiritual because that was kind of how my mind conceptualized it was that it's sort of like I had spirit guides that I shared my body with yeah. and we all kind of had that perspective. Um, so yeah, so like every altar kind of felt like the other ones were spirits um, because that made sense. It was like, okay, I've heard, you know, ghost stories. I've heard spirit stories. I've heard about these things. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. And so that's kind of the narrative that I was drawn to. So I felt like a normal person, you know, every one of us felt like a normal person just with this like spiritual gift in a way. Um, so I think that was kind of what it was like. And I remember there were definitely some instances where it interrupted things in childhood. Like there were, you know, strong spiritual beliefs that I had of like, oh yeah, I can like talk with this spirit. Um, and, you know, sharing that when you're like in middle school or in high school or something like that can be a little stigmatizing. So um, so there was that sort of thing, but at the same time, I was such a unique person because of this. And I think people were really fascinated with just who I was um, because they saw me, you know, as one person, but I had all of these different facets of personality and of identity. And I think that they just um, were really drawn to me as well. So I didn't really get like bullied in, you know, middle and high school because of this, but I also had rumors spread about me. So it was this very weird nuance of like, people were super fascinated and also like question there are a lot of questions right. there's a lot of gossip as well so it was a really really unique experience as far as yeah. like childhood goes uh-huh I'm sure I can't mm -hmm. imagine and was there any when did you start kind of seeking out or getting support around you know this is a unique experience and and I love that you shared that stat that one percent of the population mm -hmm. that's a lot of people mm -hmm. um when did you start either seeking out or finding support around how to, I don't even know what the right word I want to use is, manage but not manage, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and navigate your life in the world and especially your healing? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I first like started getting support for PTSD. Like that was where I first started, which was pretty much within about like six months of after escaping the last person who victimized me. So I was like, okay, I know that I went through trauma and I obviously need support for that. So I started getting help for PTSD and then um, went through that therapist. He was a student. So he like, you know, graduated his student work and things like that. So he ended up leaving and I was transferred to someone else. And that was a therapist that I actually explored this with. Um, I had, I'd had a surgery at the end of like 2016 um, and just some like personal stress. I had gone home to see family, which is also the same town that I was trafficked in, even though I didn't know that at the time. And a whole bunch of factors basically stacked up to create a lot of exhaustion and trauma. Yeah. And um, all of a sudden I was dissociating. So I was like losing track of time. Um, my whole house was clean and I didn't remember cleaning it or apartment, I don't know, house, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyways, my whole apartment was cleaned and um, I'd be like, I don't remember eating that food. I remember making it, but not eating it. So I had all these things. And then there were different handwritings in my journals and things like that. And I was like, this is weird. So, <laughs> so I brought all of that stuff up with my therapist and we started to explore dissociative disorders and specifically DID and um, how the diagnosis actually came up like as an official thing was uh, that one of the other alters came to therapy than the other alter who had been going oh, for a long yeah. time. So he was just like, hi, it's me. And um, my therapist the next time, you know, told the alter who 
um, who had regularly been going to therapy of like, yeah, I think that this is the right diagnosis to go for. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the topics that we talk a lot about on the show is the idea of reorienting. Mm. So especially after traumatic experiences and periods of our life, like we're altered from them. And so we start to kind of reorient to ourself and our life and our work and our relationships. And I would love to hear what that process looked like for you and was it different for all of your alters? Yeah. Um, I want to say actually the reorientation that I felt the most intensely has actually been more recent. So with the fusion, I think was the biggest thing. Yeah. Um, because like there were like small reorientations and and things that were coming up. Yeah, so the reorientation was something that happened in small instances as alters and things like that, where it was, you know, um, we'd go through like periods of trauma memories and reorienting to those and gathering more information. But it was really only when the full narrative became clear um, that that reorientation, I think, really happened. Because, you know, DID was something that I had lived with since I knew myself as a person, yeah. um, or we all knew ourselves as people. And um, so there wasn't really a reorienting. That was just kind of how I'd adapted and survived and lived. And then all of a sudden that changed um, when I really remembered the fact that I was sex trafficked, when I really remembered what that meant to be, you know, literally bought and sold as a person, um, like modern day slavery and experiencing that sort of thing. And um, realizing that that changed both my whole trauma identity, as well as literally my identity in terms of final fusion. And yeah, just reorienting to that was this drastic process that I'm definitely still partially in um, because I think we all (laughs) reorient uh, consistently throughout our lives. But I think, um, I think the biggest thing is that it kind of gave me a new lesson in terms of pain. I think that that was the the biggest reorientation that happened because with, um, with DID, like a lot of what happens is that you repress that, right? So you like are dissociated at least to a certain extent from the pain that you have. And, um, I could remember a lot and I still like felt emotion strongly and things like that as different alters. We all felt them in different ways, but it really wasn't until I had full access to my entire mind, to my entire brain, to my entire emotions as a fusion that I suddenly was really experiencing like the fullness of pain and the fullness of hurt. And um, yeah, so I think it was really like reorienting to that sort of process. Yeah. I know you mentioned earlier around the fusion that it was, it sounded like there was a moment or maybe it built to this moment of, okay, I'm, I'm ready to do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was very sudden, actually, all of a sudden. Um, so there were four adult alters. So, you know, those of us that felt like we were adults, there was one child alter, which is a very common experience. He was five years old. That's how he identified. So the four adults um, in the system, which is what a group of alters is called. Um, so the four adults of us, um, we, we basically just had this moment of like, I feel like final fusion is right. Like it just hit one night where it was just like, that suddenly feels right. And it never had before. So reorienting to that and in terms of like coming to terms with it and accepting it was a very emotional process and very grief focused um, because it also meant letting go of who we all individually were. Um, You know, because like we would become a person who had traits and who we were technically all a part of um, because we'd be all our whole brain would be living, you know, life 24 seven. And yet at the same time, we'd be losing ourselves. So there was a big grief process there because like no one really talks about that experience. No one really talks about like what happens if you completely lose your identity where it's, it's beyond the point of like trauma reorienting, but it's literally a different person. And I think going through that process also taught me a lot about trauma reorientation and just reorienting to life events. Um, Because there's just such a significant, like, need of letting go. And I think how I saw it and how I've kind of conceptualized that since is it very much feels like what I imagine reincarnation would be like, Mm. where it's that sense of like, I am still all of the people I was before and yet I'm totally new as well. So I feel like that's how I've really conceptualized it. So going through that process in a conscious way, because like personally, I do believe in reincarnation, but you know, we kind of just in that process would just die and we'd reincarnate and we wouldn't really have a say in that process. (laughs) So going through it when you have a say is a very, very unique experience. And yeah, I think that was, that was, that really stood out to me. Yeah. What did the grief process look like? It was very quick actually. Um, because I think, well, we had had a long history of doing a lot of acceptance work just when it came to trauma Mm -hmm. and memories and things like that. So radical acceptance and just validation was such a key part of recovery and of healing. So 
the grief was very well accepted, um, but it was also very intense. I mean, the initial moment when Final Fusion felt right, like I remember that the altar who was up front just sat down on the ground and just started crying. Like it was just, you know, this very intense. And he was a lot more of like a less emotional, like more protector based kind of punk a little bit. Um, <laughs> and he just, you know, cried. Like it was just this very raw, real grief. And um, the whole process had some grief to it. You know, it had so much beauty and it also had so much grief because it was this process of, you know, kind of experiencing these mini fusions where like two of us would combine and have like a couple hours together um, as a new person and kind of like testing the waters. Like our brain was just sort of testing that experience yeah. and not knowing when that wouldn't dissolve, you know? So like every time that that happened, would it stay permanently? And about four weeks after this initial, okay, I think final fusion is right that we had, um, it was me. Like I, I just, yeah, all five of us combined and we expected, you know, or like the I that I was at the time, um, expected that to dissolve. And then I just yeah. woke up the next day and was still com combined and woke up the next and the next and the next and realized mm -hmm. like, oh, wow, this is stuck. Um, so it was a very interesting grief in the sense that like, there was that uncertainty around it as well. And, yeah. and that kind of continuous questioning that uncertainty brings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would love if you could share a little bit, if you're open to it. I know you posted mm -hmm. about this on your Instagram after the fusion, getting your hair cut mm -hmm. and how before it was, you know, you had these different altars and they were all different personalities and people. And what was it like to navigate before, like how you wanted to express yourself out in the world, having those five different altars? Yeah. So it was a constant game. I mean, having five people who all had a valid right to self-expression because none of us was more of a person than the other. So it was really this consistent sense of like, <clears throat> of like, okay, how can we get a style that appeases all of us? Because one of the biggest challenges is that, you know, when you're living in your body, right, you want to feel happy in the body that yeah. you're in. You want to feel like it's your body um, and that you're expressing yourself through it. And as a trans person as well, I've experienced a lot of dysphoria, which is basically the like incongruency of not seeing my body how I feel like it should look. Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of that that, you know, we'd work through. I had had like surgeries, hormone replacement therapy, things like that. Um, but when it came to living with these different identities who all had times of being up front and all had different presentations of how we wanted to look, that was a huge challenge because we all sort of ex had to compromise and experience a little bit of that dysphoria yeah. and just minimize it for all of us. So some of it was easy, like in terms of outfits, like um, Bale, the one that I was talking about earlier, who had the, the crying on the moment floor, uh, like crying on the floor moment. Um, <laughs> he, um, he was a lot more like punk like. So, you know, we had some like kind of uh, leather jackets and that yeah. sort of like black jeans and things like that. And that was really validating for him. Um, but he really liked, you know, the idea of having more like shaved sides to the head and like hair that was pulled back in a top knot. And then there was another altar named Scion who really wanted like a full head of like curly but short hair. And like those just weren't congruent. Like they right. couldn't, like both of those couldn't <laughs> be satisfied. Um, and then uh, Arian, which is the name that I used to go under um, because he was kind of the most upfront, the most present, um, especially in business. Um, so he kind of wanted a like slightly curly wavy, but like more bangs. So it was also incongruent. So we kind of had yeah. to settle on this style that was like sort of an undercut. So it had the like kind of shorter sides and stuff. And then it had a whole bunch of curls on top that could come forward a little bit like a bang or kind of fall over the head a little bit, depending on how it was styled. So it was this sort of like, it kind of met the needs of all of them a little bit. Um, and then we had this one altar named Ava who was a lot more feminine identifying. Mm -hmm. um, so we had to have like wigs and things like that. And um, they were also mute as well. So that was a real uh, like complicated thing to navigate yeah. as well that they couldn't speak, um, which is pretty common that like different altars will have different um, traits like that. And so there was also that sort of navigation and like, you know, that kind of communication uh, challenge and things like that. And yeah, so it was a lot of like um, kind of living multiple lives, like as if like yeah. you were to imagine like, okay, when I go to work, I have to appear as this person. When I'm at home, I have to appear as this person and like try doing that and wanting different hairstyles in each role. Like that is such yeah. a, such a hard thing to navigate <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And I loved your post when you shared your haircut and being happy with mm -hmm. it. What, what other things, I mean, this is that whole reorienting, what other things have you like shifted maybe subtly or dramatically after the fusion? 
Yeah, well, definitely the hair. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I love this new haircut. Like it's, it's me and it's like really me. So, um, so there's that, there's been a shift in sexuality. So different alters have different gender presentations and sexualities. Mm -hmm. And, and it's very common for pretty much everyone with DID to have, you know, some alter that has a slightly different gender identity or different sexuality. That's extremely common. Yeah. And, um, it's a lot easier for me now though, because I identify as someone who's masculine and I identify as someone who's gay. And that's just like clearer for me. Yeah. Um, and I don't really need to like worry about how that identity is sort of being perceived by some people. Cause it was very difficult before of like, okay, if I go to this cafe looking this way, then I show up going to that same cafe looking this way, are they going to be really confused? Or are they going yeah. to be questioning? Are they going to be looking at me weird? And things like that. But it was sort of this like, constant dividing up of life and that's a huge thing that I've been able to just let go of it's like yeah. I can go where I want however I want to look and recognize like it's still me showing up all of those places um and one of the other big things is that I think all of my tastes and things also diversified so I I don't really like swing all the way over to punk and I don't swing all the way over to feminine but I'm very much you know like I'm like okay sometimes I'm kind of a little bit more in a mood for like you know, that sort of leather jacket and that nice sort of sleek look and things like that. Sometimes I'm like today where I'm wearing this like cozy, you know, comfortable knit colorful sweater. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'm like feeling that more feminine, like I want to do a little bit of makeup or something like that, but it's all still me. Like it, it doesn't really have that division between it or yeah. anything like that. It's just aspects of my presentation and how I am feeling like what parts of me I want to express that day without it actually being separate parts. Yeah. So, yeah. Is there any... Is there any aspects of the different identities that disappeared that you're aware of or that you miss? That's actually a really good question because I've thought a lot about that. And I think the thing that I initially missed was being able to have conversations whenever mm -hmm. I wanted. So like that was something that yeah. I remember experiencing a new type of loneliness. Um, and yet it was a lot less painful than before. So yeah. I felt more lonely when I was separate, when I was, you know, five different people than I actually felt as this fusion, as me. Um, and yet I also experienced more loneliness now because I am logistically alone. And before it was sort of like having a family in my head yeah. um, or being a family in my head really would be a better word, um, better phrase. So yeah, so that's definitely something that was let go of. But as far as traits, I think I really, one of the coolest things is that I gained the skills of every different altar. So um, like Bale was better at like drawing realistically and like getting anatomy really good and things mm. like that. So I'm like, cool, I can do that. And I can paint now, which is one of the other altar skills yeah. or before some altars really weren't good at baking and some were, and now I can bake fine and I can cook fine. <laughs> and like, you know, so it's really kind of cool to have seen all of these different altars develop different skills and abilities, because yeah. I think it kind of gave me this gift of having a lot of different skills that I suddenly gained because we all were individual people. So we had the ability to sort of focus our part of the brain on developing those skills. And then now I get all of those. So, so that's a little <laughs> bit of a like lucky special thing. I'm like, okay, I can write music. I can paint, I can draw, I can awesome. um, bake, I can cook. Like, yeah, all of these things that we had all separately done. Yeah. Um, so there really was more that was gained than let go of. It was really just the experience of being multiple people that I think was what was let go of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, I love that. I, I would love to talk about joy with you. So you talked about yeah. the moment with the flower, but what was your relationship to joy before that? Yeah, so joy has actually been something that's been in my life, I think, since I can remember. Um, which a lot of people might be like, well, how is that possible, right? Like you were being sex trafficked, you were being sold, right. like traumatized. And yet some of my most joyous moments were also in the midst of my painful moments. And I want to clarify something that I think I see joy as, and obviously everyone has different descriptions and ideas and things like that, is that I see joy as a state of being that's inherently within us. So I think that it's sort of like this light that's right at our yeah. core. And there's a lot of things that cover it up, right? Where like, you know, pain, trauma, oppression, um, you know, rejection, uh, stress, you know, a whole bunch of things, um, just distracting emotions, distracting TV shows, whatever it is, like, you know, anything can kind of create these layers and these sort of layers of fog on top of this joy within us. And I don't think that they need to be all cleared away because I think sometimes they just move around in a certain way that that joy has the ability to shine through because I think it's really bright. And mm -hmm. I think in the midst of my pain, that joy sometimes shone through as a way to help me survive it. Um, where I think that that joy was sort of like, it kind of showed me like, hey, this isn't all pain. 
like you are experiencing a lot of pain and you are experiencing the full brunt of that. And at the same time, here's a little glimmer of something else. Because I remember like one time specifically where I was like, I think I had just actually been like sexually assaulted um, and I was laying down after and my abuser was still in the room. And I remember there just being a little bit of sunlight that came through this window and it just mm -hmm. landed right on my arm. And I just felt so intensely peaceful and hopeful in that moment for just like a split second. And then it hurt really bad too. And then I was like, okay, now I feel my pain. And yet I also felt some sort of peace with that pain because I had experienced it so fully and I had really um, bared witness to it. So I feel like joy is sort of this process of bearing witness to basically everything. Um, but I think it's the process of bearing witness to the beauty in everything specifically. Um, yeah. Because I think that there is a lot of beauty in pain as well. And one of the things that this isn't so much the like before, but it is still the, the processing of the pain from before is I feel like sometimes I have like this volcano in me, right? This boiling pit mm. of, um, yeah. of like magma that doesn't want to like explode necessarily, but it's more just terrifying. Like where it's just like, I'm standing on the edge of that. And I'm often very aware that I'm standing on the edge of that. So I feel that terror, I feel that intensity, I feel that hurt that this represents. And it's larger than me in a lot of ways. And it does feel like it's larger than me. And yet I think the joy that's there is recognizing that it's also magnificent and stunning and yeah. just so enthralling in its own way. And accessing that joy for me has really been about bearing witness to that and, and just really being like, okay, I can stand here. And even though it's large and it's intense and it's overwhelming, um, I'm still here. I'm still bearing witness to it. I'm still existing with it. And it's more like, it's more like making peace with the fact that pain is a part of life too. And that's really where I feel like then all of that resistance goes away, all of that, like I'm fighting the reality that I live with and in the space that, and in the energy of that resistance, because that uses a lot of energy. So when we let that energy go, it makes room for that joy to shine through alongside the pain. So yeah. I think that that was a big thing is that in those moments when I surrendered, like on an internal way, um, even when I was in the midst of trauma, even like directly in the midst of it, yeah. that joy shone through because my resistance had stepped aside. Yeah. yeah. What do you think allowed you to kind of hold space for both? I talk a lot about the duality. My next book is mm -hmm. going to be called The Magic and the Madness and how it was really hard for me with my trauma and abuse to hold both. It's like either a person is good and kind and the experience was good um, and joyful, or it was traumatic and awful and they're a bad person and all the things. And what I have found when I look at the history of, especially my relationship trauma and sexual abuse and things like that, like there was magic and there was madness and, and being yeah. able to hold both has been for me personally, incredibly healing. And it's like, sometimes I can be in the rage and the fury and the anger and the hurt. And other times I can just be cleanly in the like, that was really sweet. And this was really beautiful about it. And, and, and I can hold both and not wobble one direction or another. What do you think? I'd love to hear your thoughts on duality, but also what do you think kind of gave you that ability to be open to both in the midst of so much abuse and trauma? Yeah. So I think first just that ability and like how I got that was definitely tying back into that resistance. So when we're in pain, we want to resist that pain. That's just a natural human urge. We want to pull away from it. We want to distance ourselves from it. And that can show up just in terms of like a flinch away from something. It can show up all the way through, you know, dissociation and amnesia and compartmentalizing and things that happen to protect us. So I want to acknowledge that resistance is not something bad. It's adaptive. And at the same time, that resistance can also become maladaptive or too much to a certain extent. Or maybe our way to freedom is through letting go of that resistance, is to fully surrendering to a situation um, in that moment. And that doesn't mean that we like stop fighting it or we stop like doing what we can to advocate for ourselves in that situation, but it's rather recognizing this is happening to me right now and I can't change that in this moment. Yeah. And when we really step into that, whether that's I'm experiencing this emotion right now, I can't change it and I hear it. And it's really that additional step of like, and I'm with you. I'm with myself in this moment. I'm showing up here and I'm present with the experience, but it's not the like presence that we often hear a lot of like self-help people talk about and mindfulness gurus and all of those <laughs> sort of things. Um, it's really just this idea of like, I'm showing up for myself. And that can look like 
just being like, I'm in pain and I'm not going to change that right now. I'm just going to explore and look at that pain. I'm just going to honor the fact that I'm feeling something right now. And this is a huge journey that's so individual for everyone. But, um, but I think that one of the biggest things is like that, that resistance is what tends to stop us from kind of being able to access that duality because it takes up so much space. It's sort of like, you know, if you imagine like uh, the storage on your computer, right? Like um, resistance is like 50% of that. So, and like, but then there's this huge emotion, right? So it's like, okay, like pain is half of that. So like, let's say grief, right? So like grief is 50% of that and then resisting the grief because you don't want to feel yeah. it. Resisting <laughs> that grief is the other 50%. So your storage is full. And that doesn't leave room for the duality of like, maybe you're grieving, but you also feel grateful for having known that person, you know, or something like that. And the resistance isn't allowing that, I'm hesitant to say the word positive, but that encapsulates the idea. Um, it's not allowing that sort of feel good feeling to come in because we're spending so much of that storage on resistance. Yeah. So if we can lower that resistance, even just a little, even just for a moment of like, okay, I'm just going to breathe into my grief right now. I'm going to feel it. I'm going to say, okay, grief, I hear you. I see you. And it's okay that you're here. Anything as simple as that drops that resistance down and it makes room suddenly for something else to fill that gap. Cause the grief is already there. It's already taken up its space. It's not going to fill in that gap. It's rather something else, like maybe a sense of peace or a sense of comfort or a sense of, you know, you're not feeling as alone because you just showed up for yourself. Or maybe there is anger and anger can actually be a very positive, fueling, yeah. like wonderful emotion. You know, whatever it is that sort of needs to fill up that space, there suddenly is room for balance and resistance. The more we have of that, the less room there is for that balance. And I think that that's really what I learned along the way. And like, you know, when I was like in the middle of being sexually assaulted or something like that, and like, I was hurting, I was like somewhat dissociated. I was like, you know, having this experience and I was like wanting to pull away from that, but there was no way that I could physically get out of that situation in the moment. Right. And there were times that I was just like, okay, then I'm here and I'm just going to be here with myself. And I'm just going to like retreat inward and just like be like, wow, I'm really hurting right now. And when I pay attention to my hurt rather than what was going on necessarily, because I couldn't change that. Um, so when I really kind of turned inwards and was like, oh, I'm really hurting here, I'm really scared then suddenly I felt like I could survive it more. It wasn't that I felt good and I didn't right. feel like, you know, any sort of like duality that was like, oh, I suddenly felt joyous in that way. But I felt more free because I was sort of like free to choose how I addressed my own pain. Yeah. And I think that was a huge thing. And like, you know, having experienced like modern day slavery, which is the absolute absence of freedom, finding that freedom in myself was something that was so important and critical yeah. too. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's really powerful. And yeah really challenging to do, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's one of those things that it's both challenging and incredibly simple. It's yeah. challenging because oh, yeah. our resistance <laughs> doesn't want to let us do it. <laughs> yeah. So it seems really challenging because honestly, I believe that we all know exactly how to do this for ourselves. Like we all know how to show up and yeah. like face our pain and stuff. We might not be able to do it for a very long period of time because maybe it's too intense. So like, you know, this is something that takes time to cultivate that skill, but I think we all know what that skill is. It's just that our resistance doesn't want to let us know that we know. So true. Uh -huh. <laughs> I want to talk about your incredible work and how you got into it. And so what was kind of the timeline of there was the abuse when you were younger, the sex trafficking, and then there was a period of healing, and then there was the abuse with your friend. And where in the timeline of everything that you've been through and your healing, like where did you start kind of the seeds of what your work is now? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I think survival was very much the seeds of where my work is now. So that entire experience and, yeah. um, and yeah, just kind of like a brief recap of the timeline. Um, so it was around like six or seven, I think, was when I started to be groomed by my trafficker, maybe where I started actually being trafficked. I don't have the exact dates and everything, but um, around six or seven. And then that went until I was probably around 12, maybe 13. Um, so a very long period of time. And yeah. then in that early like adolescence, um, and just throughout like high school, basically throughout that period, um, there was one altar up front who remembered none of this, remembered absolutely mm -hmm. no trauma and, but yet dealt with a lot of pain. So like had like suicidal ideation, self-harmed, yeah. like things like that. Um, so there was that experience where there wasn't really this like handling the trauma because there was no acknowledgement of what was actually hurting. It was just this sort of like, this alter didn't know anything to get through high school and to kind of probably get free, you know, because if we could yeah. go off to college, we would be free and things like that. So then she kind of dissolved. Um, and uh, and sort of just disappeared and stuff. And then the five of us that I was talking about earlier really like 
sort of reawaken because she was kind of present during that short period yeah. of time. And then, you know, five of us before that, five of us after that. Um, so the five of us reawakened and with that, some of the memories. So during that time I confided in my best friend um, or one of us alters did and confided in our best friend and she then decided to victimize us, sexually abuse us mm. for 13 more months. Wow. Um, and that was incredib an incredible betrayal. So um, eventually, I think it was 2015, um, I got free of her. And um, that was when I think the, the journey really started. So part of it, like I had been doing some blogging on, in terms of like spirituality and mindfulness and just sort of talking about things while I was being um, abused by my best friend as well, because um, I think I needed to sort of have a community in order to like feel yeah. accountable to people so that I would continue to survive. Um, so I talked a little bit about like the stuff I was doing then because I knew Reiki, I did yoga and like things like that. And um, was just sort of experiencing these things that you explore as like a 20 year old. And I, I shared a little bit about that. I had a sort of community. Um, and then it was really once I got out of that situation and got a little bit of stability that I started to really dive into, okay, like what is, um, what is like personal about them? What is healing? Like, what are, what are these things? And it was so inaccessible. And I think that was the biggest thing for me is that I was like, none of this helps. Like, I was like, this is all so invalidating. And it felt like everything that I was reading was from people who didn't know what it was like to really hurt in this sort of way. And so I was like, okay, I, this is frustrating. This is painful. This is invalidating. So I'm going to start writing about these techniques and these things that I'm reading in a way that makes it accessible. So I took the yeah. like seeds out of, okay, here's like what I learned from this or here's what I can see that I could learn from this. And I started to pull those apart. Um, so sort of dismantling this really common like system that was out there yeah. and, and pulling those pieces apart. And that's kind of what led to Uncover Your Joy and the work that I do today is like being able to talk about that both through the guys of like living with mental illness, living with PTSD, and then living with like, you know, the pain of trauma and things like that. And then since then, I've really um, gone back to, I think, my roots of having explored joy and how joy has been a coping mechanism for me since I was being trafficked. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really sort of where I've landed most recently is really kind of um, learning like how was joy both something that I uncovered and how was it also something that saved me as I went along all of this yeah. um, and really tapping into that experience. So that was sort of the kind of recap of my journey and how I started doing yeah. this. Yeah. And t tell us about your amazing program. I know you and I have talked about it quite mm -hmm. a bit and, and how it really came to be. Was it organic? Was it, did it like mm -hmm. find inspiration? Yeah. So I kind of found that, you know, there was sort of this journey that I had gone on, um, these sort of key pieces that had allowed me to access more joy, like access more of those sort of states and to balance out. To, so, so, so like that, you know, storage thing that I was saying, like the, to lower the resistance so more joy and more of that good stuff could start to come forward. Um, so basically that's kind of what the prosperity path is, is that it's really all about like lowering that resistance and then gaining clarity on sort of what you want and what you can do to shape either side of that spectrum to increase maybe some intentionally good things in your life or to decrease some of the obstacles and challenges. Um, so basically it was sort of this foundation, like, or this, this sort of process, like step-by-step -step process that built upon the foundation of the previous step. Um, so the first thing was all about acceptance, where it was literally just like, how do you actually start to release some of that resistance? And what are the things that we do need to accept as trauma survivors? And what is the sort of BS that's out there about acceptance that is, you know, uh, invalidating or bypassing or things like that? Um, so that was kind of the first, that's like the core, the first module. And then it moves into empowerment. So now that we have this acceptance, what sort of choices can we make about ourselves, how we interact with ourselves and the world to better protect that sort of space that we have within ourselves. So it was really moving into that stage, which is the empowerment. And then it's the clarity. And then it's saying like, okay, what are some of the dreams that I have? What are some of the goals? Now you have this foundation of, okay, I have less resistance and I have more of my power back. Now, what do I want to do with that? And that's sort of clarity where it's examining things like core values and stuff like that. But from a trauma-informed lens, that was the third step. And then from there, it was a lot of like logistic work, just acknowledging how trauma makes it more difficult. So, you know, really identifying the obstacles and really getting to understand them and know them was the fourth step. And then it was creating solutions, but making sure that those solutions were in line with our heart and our core values and also in line with what was possible as well. And re recognizing that like, Sometimes there are things that can and can't be solved depending on our circumstances in life. 
Um, So that was the fifth stage. And then the sixth one and the final one is really this idea of taking action. And it's also overcoming a few things like fear of procrastination and hesitating and fear of failure and all of those sort of like (laughs) roadblocks that we come across. Um, So I address all of those sort of things because I remember sort of having this sort of clarity form and and things like this. Um, And then I was like, oh, but now I don't want to do any of that work. I'm like, I know what I need to do, but now I don't want to do it. And that's kind of what that sixth stage is, is all about okay, getting to the point where you actually do want to do that work and starting to sort of put yourself on the path that you had created for yourself. So it's basically this framework, this path, and it was built off of my own lived experience as well as I found myself time and time again when I was working with people one-on-one or writing blogs or doing videos or things like that, keeping, like I kept referencing pieces of this. And then I was like looking back and I was like, you know, this is what it is. Like, this is the path that I went on. And yeah, it's, it's an offering. It's a path. It's a guidance. It's um, something that is customizable and unique. And I think that that was the biggest point, point of it too, is that yeah. it offers techniques and it offers suggestions and guidance and a framework um, yeah. rather than it just being something that was like, okay, here's how you do this. Here's exactly what you need to do. And it wasn't right. like as preachy as some of the programs that you see out there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Definitely. Uh-huh. How do you, um, I have kind of a two-parter question, but mm-hmm. since the fusion, how do you, feel about or relate to your body of work and what's next for you? Yeah. So that's actually a really good question because A, I'm still figuring it out a little bit and B, um, it definitely has changed. So one of the unique things is that the prosperity path um, was something that I had been working on like back in 2019, I think is when I started like the beginning of 2019 or even the end of 2018. So I was still five different people during that time. And it was Arian, the kind of primary alter who did this work, who founded Uncover Your Joy that was doing this. So I sort of picked that up because there was a whole bunch of work, all the videos were recorded, all of that. And I was like, okay, well, I definitely want to do this. Um, And it's very important. And I still believe in that sort of path and that framework. And yet I'm also recognizing so many more things that I'm like, oh, I would have added this or I would have done these sort of things. And I don't think that it's incomplete or unhelpful in any sort of way. And yet it's kind of just that human process of when we look back at something that we created a while ago, we have this new perspective and stuff. So, um, So it's definitely something that there's so much additional piece, there's so many additional pieces to it. And I think how I've been learning to reconcile that is leaving the program B because I think that it is a beautiful program and it's definitely still something that I believe in. Um, And I think it's filled with tons of information and resources and worksheets and like doable stuff. (laughs) And at the same time, creating this idea of community around it. So instead of it just sort of being the standalone program, seeing, okay, how can I like keep interacting and keep growing alongside the people who join it? in a way that isn't just like, here's the program and I'm leaving it goodbye. Right. It's more of this sort of sense of like, I'm working on um, probably over the next like month or two, creating an like alumni community, which is basically where I can continue to have conversations about the things in it and add the new thoughts that I have about joy and the new thoughts I have about this process and acceptance and empowerment and boundaries and all the things that this program talks about. So that's kind of yeah. one of the shifts. And then I also want to make these more accessible, smaller programs where maybe they're like, three to five videos or something like that, where maybe it's just a deep dive into like emotional validation and acceptance. So it's for people who are like, you know, I really like that bit, but I'm not feeling the entire path or I'm not ready for an entire path. I just want that skill. So that's also been a shift that I've gone on um, is really starting to see how can I make the contents of my program even more accessible for people. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going through that right now too. Accessibility feels very important to me right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is one thing that you wish you knew or one belief or mindset or tool or resource or skill that you had at the beginning of your journey? Hmm. I mean, I thought about this one. So I know that you sent over questions before, and this is one that kind of had me a little stumped. So I'm going to kind of live explore this here, but um, I think, I think I want the biggest thing that I wish that I had known when I first started this real like healing journey, when I was getting intentional about healing is that there is two things. So one is that there is always healing, but there's never healed. I think that's a big thing um, because I don't think that a lot of the wounds that we experience are things that will like close up and disappear completely. Um, I think that it's more about navigating those and accepting them and bringing them into our heart than it is about erasing them. So I think that's one thing that I wish um, I had known. And then I think I wish that I knew that collective healing is just as important as individual healing yes. um, because that's a big thing that I've been learning, especially lately, especially with the pandemic and you know everything just really being highlighted in the world 
Um, and so much of my life, because like how, you know, abusers and traffickers keep their control on their victims is isolating them. So isolation was normal for me. Like that was something that I kind of expected and thought that that was the way things were meant to be. And there just isn't enough talk about collective healing and the fact that sometimes I think our pain is larger than us because it's, you know, maybe years upon years of things. And sometimes we need other people to help us bear witness to it too. Yeah. And I think that that's okay. And I wish that I had known that as well, that like, this isn't something that you need to feel capable of doing alone. Um, like you can survive it alone. Like your body is great at surviving. Your mind will get through it, but the actual yeah. healing, the actual bearing witness, the actual like, um, dropping that resistance, finding that joy may also be at the companionship of others. Um, yeah. So I think I wish that I knew um, to focus on that more. Yeah. I love that. Uh, I could talk to you all day. I absolutely <laughs> adore you, my friend, but to Thank kind you. Of close things up and we're going to link uh -huh. to all of your amazingness, of course, in the show notes, mm -hmm. but tell people where they can find you and how they can learn from you and work with you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the best place to find me is actually, well, I mean, I have my website, uncoveryourjoy.com, um, which has all my blogs and my resources and all the work with me stuff. Um, but I think the place where I have the most conversation, so if you're really interested in like being alongside these conversations and um, growing with me, you know, where it's not just like, like we're in this together, that sort of thing would be my Instagram. So that's yeah. Kalyan Inspires um, and you'll link to it, but it's basically just my name and then the word inspires. And um that is definitely, yeah, that's my kind of go-to place. And I also technically post all of my Instagram posts on my Facebook, but I found that Instagram has more uh, community and more like collective conversation. So yeah. Instagram is kind of my favorite place to be. So if you want to really I love your connect, Instagram. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, it still is small, but like I just kind of rejoined it a couple months ago. So, so I'm yeah. like still, I like figured it out and now I'm like, oh my gosh, I love Instagram. It's so. one of my favorite places too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh, awesome. Uh -huh. Well, Kelly, yeah. thank you so much for being here. I adore you. Your work is incredible. Everybody, please check it out. And just thank you so much for being so open and honest about your journey and everything that you've learned along the way. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been an absolute joy, really, to be here. Thank you so much for joining us today and for being a part of this powerful community of purpose-driven individuals. We have a ton of free resources for you at www.talesfromthejourney.tv slash free, including access to an eight-week sampler of our renowned journey mapping program. That gives you instant access to impactful training lessons, life-changing exercises, and our signature AccuSesh processes that you can implement immediately. We'd love your help in getting the message out and growing our community, so please take a moment to share this episode, subscribe to the podcast, and leave us a review on iTunes. I'll catch you in the next episode.